Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have the complete delight of speaking with the one and only Alexander Ebert, whose work over the years has helped me think through Hegel. I think his work in the first uh, philosophy portal anthology on um, on Hegel at the end of the doctrine of being has been remarkably helpful. I find myself, without even realizing it, using freak theory. I find myself referencing the idea of if you escape uh, death, if you always avoid death that you become cancerous. I find it just kind of permeating my language and my thinking. And that's always the sign of strong thinking, that you just can't help but find yourself using it. And so for over all these years, I find that being the case with Alexander Ebert's work. I really appreciated his re recent presentation with uh, the class on Lacan at Philosophy Portal, talking about the static drive and trying to think about what does Lacan actually mean with the deaf drive? Is there another way to kind of think through this and how that comes together with the status anxiety that he writes on so well? And so, Alexander Ebert, to start, if I were to ask you about static drive, and we'll see where we go from there, I'll throw that at you. And I really appreciate this opportunity today, sir. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. I'm a little chill today, so people will get to uh, experience that. Um, <laughs> uh, static drive. Um, okay, so stasis, static, right? something which is seemingly standing still uh, and in that stillness um, one finds the undifferentiated um, because you can almost think of um, static on a television or something. Um, it is impossible to pick out any one determinate item and hold on to it. Everything is mushed, right? Now, the idea that I'm coupling static with drive would indicate that we somehow want that mush. Like we somehow want that mush. We keep driving toward it. Now, drive is usually associated with death, death drive, right? which is itself a kind of stasis. Uh, there's another word that is related to stasis, identical to stasis in a lot of ways, which is um, inertia. That which is um, unmoving also, right? And yet something that is has inertia, or sorry, something which is um, undynamically uh, or undynamic, non-dynamical, could be moving, but it's non-dynamical. It's moving at a constant rate, let's say, right? Um, if you have a sense that your, your, uh, your identity has inertia, you have a sense that your identity is uninterruptible, right? It's just going to fly off into the horizon of time. Um, fame, certain levels, thresholds of fame can feel like they have uh, sort of inert identity in the sense that they have inertia. They're still, they're static. They're not going to change. They're immortal. So you start to get to a sense of why we might be attracted to stasis all of a sudden. So I start talking about immortality, right? And so the idea that we want, for instance, in a partner, someone who we can rely on, someone who can, we can trust, and so we might project an image of an object of our desire being an object which never changes, an object which we want to remain static, which we want to be inert. We want to know what it is. In the, the, the definition of trust or the, 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 the construction of trust, um, I think even in our personal experiences, is basically what I would call like, Achievable by risk redundancy. Like um, if I know that I every time I interact with person X, I have basically this, I'm, I'm risking the same amount of differentiation from person X from one day to the other. I can be pretty sure that person X is going to be person X when I see person X. And that person X on Tuesday is pretty much person X on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. And the more person X is the same as what they were the day before, the more trust develops, negative or positive. I trust them to be an asshole, or I trust them to be a good person, or I trust them to be yellow or blue or pink. You have a high uh, degree of trust, the higher the experience of 
redundancy. Again, stasis, static, inert, right? And so we start to again see like why static drive makes sense. Because it doesn't simply refer to death, which it also does, dynamically static, dynamically um, undynamical, right? Dynamically flat, troughs up at the peaks, peaks down at the troughs, flat line. Whereas this, you know, in freak theory and stuff we, we may get into, represents dynamism as a waveform or whatever. The non-dynamical is represented by a flat line. So it is death, but it's also the object of our desire to experience a sort of celebra a, a, a positive small death um, in the otherwise flux nature of our interactions <clears throat> with others and with ourselves. We want to achieve a static state. I want to become a rock star. I don't mean just any old rock star. I mean the kind of rock star that's literally embossed in rock. The kind that won't change. The kind that your kids, kids, kids will remember because I want immortality. And the more I feel that sense of stasis, the safer I feel. The more inert, phenomenologically, Meaning, the more non-dynamical my experience with my environment means the more at equilibrium I am with my environment. So if I experience me and this mug, right? I'm experiencing difference. There is a dynamic relationship between us. It's red. I'm blue. I'm a human. It's a cup. So there's a lot of there's a high degree of dynamism between us. But... If I have a low degree of dynamism between us, I start to blend and bleed into the cup. And suddenly I am one with the cup and the cup is one with me and so on. Um, and what does that sound like phenomenologically? Where we don't feel any difference between the pressure, the temperature hitting our skin and the temperature and pressure on the exterior of our subjective experience, where our subjective experience begins to expand and include our entire environment because our entire environment feels self similar to our interior. So that the experience of being in the world is a, an experience of pure interiority. Now, what does that sound like? It sounds like the womb. That is, that's got to be the experience of the womb. In fact, if you've ever done sensory deprivation chambers or anything like that, they try and recreate that exact experience. And what does it do? It deprives your senses. You no longer know which way is up, which is down, because you have self-same equilibrious pressure hit and, and temperature hitting your body. That's why like weighted blankets put people to sleep. So all of this is to say that the on a phenomenological level, the experience of the womb as self-same, static, inert, non-dynamical, the experience uh, 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 abstracted of that to uh, the notion of a non-dynamical inert identity, which is always the same, to the desire for an other who is non-dynamical, always the same, static, and engendering your trust, to death itself, right? So then we have, the, we have several layers then of this notion of static drive. One is on the biological level, as Freud would say, creatures, all biology seems to de desire to return to a state of inertia, right? So that would be death, death. But then why do we likewise exhibit after coming out of a state of inertia, being born from the state of inertia as the ultimate trauma being ripped from our interiority and creating the tear which produces the interior and exterior state, which is precisely the trauma that uh, instantiates drive, then from that point on, um, attempt to somehow recreate situations that phenomenologically feel like proxies to the womb. So this is with regard to whether it's a sense of religion or community or a sense of the 
uh, the, 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 the state of awe, the infinite now, whatever it is, or if it's a sense of desiring to acquire your exteriority by buying as much as you can, consuming and calling it all yours and bringing the exterior and external into the a sense of interiority. Um, or whether it's fucking everyone that you can see, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter what the context is. You can almost see the whole of human existence and life in general um, through the lens of static drive, and um, and then of course it relates to the notion of status anxiety, which is precisely the anxiety which is begotten <laughs> by the sad reality that those states that you hope are static aren't actually static. And you're trying to approximate and constantly, it's not that they're not actually static, it's that it's in an interplay, much like um, a, a thermodynamical interplay between uh, uh, entropy and negative entropy, where you have the forces of uh, uh, um, dissipation and equilibrium, working against the forces of uh, asymmetry, the forces uh, of, of uh, membranic um, preservation, right? Where you're trying to preserve the shape of the ice cube, despite it being in a hot glass of water, right? Because otherwise, if the hot water dissipates the whole thing, you just have uniformity, again, static, stasis. So it's not that you know, um, the experience of our static interior or the fact that I, I'm, a, I'm a doctor now or whatever are full-blown illusions. They are negentropic um, efforts uh, to attempt to create constraints and phenomen phenomenological, sociological limitations that, we that can help produce a sense of identity and these sorts of things. But what's interesting, of course, in a very Hegelian sense is that, and we'll talk about this, I'm assuming, because of limitation, which I just brought up, when you create these limitations to constrain yourself, give yourself a sense of identity in, uh, in opposition to something else, even though the fact, the fact is you want to consume that something else and make that exterior part of your interiority um, or, or sublimate yourself to it, um, the fact is that when you create those boundaries and those limitations, you produce uh, that sense of stasis within yourself, meaning the very indeterminacy which would dissolve, um, you know, uh, a, a cube of ice in a piece in, in a cup of water. Um, is being produced within the subject. In fact, that we, we tend to take that state of the subject as the ideal state, like um, the unthinking autom automatic state of the subject in which the subject doesn't question anything, in which the subject no longer needs to question anything, no longer needs to think, no longer needs to problematize anything because everything's already been solved. In fact, we view the state of the master, at least narr narratively, as that exact state in which the master no longer thinks about what they're doing. It's all now second nature. We, we, we exemplify this in the notion of the zone uh, or, you know, where you lose sort of a temporal sense of your location and, uh, and identity. Um, so there's, there's this sense in which the achievement of the inert in our lives is very real and phenomenologically potent. Like we actually do become inert internally and by inert non-dynamical we can think of it in turn in in, um, in conscious cognitive terms where we're not thinking about what we're doing we're no longer sort of um critically dynamic right because we're not encountering uh proposition errors in our environment and so we can interact with our environment. We've done the work through knowledge acquisition and so on. We've done the work to be able to interact with our environment automatically. And there's another stasis, right? The entire project of development seems to be reaching higher levels of stasis. Now, just to bring this into Hegel, those moments of stasis, each time we enter a moment of stasis through a, like, I'm trying, I'm learning, I'm, I'm a novice, I'm an expert, I'm a novice, I'm an expert, I'm a novice, I'm an expert, I'm an expert. 
a sudden you you do reach this non-dynamical state wherein you no longer think about what you're doing. It's all second nature, and suddenly you're a master. And that state of inertia, Hegel would call sublation. The first part, the learning, the mastery. This is the dialectic of of os, uh, oppositions, right? Novice, master, novice, master, novice, expert, novice, expert. And all of a sudden they collapse into the unity, inert unity, non-dynamical unity of master in which you can operate non-dynamically and automatically with the world. So it's a, it's a desirable state. It's a state that is um, uh, highly efficient with regard to the way that it inter interacts with the world. And yet it's also a dead state. So there's this problematic because you can feel like a master, oh, I mastered that, and it can become like, well, now what? I guess I got to push myself on some level. I guess I got to try something new. I'm a little bored with this or whatever it is. And I, that's why I think of philosophy of boredom, which Hegel would call self-relating negativity, where suddenly you realize, oh, wait a minute, I'm just eh, now. And, uh, and, and that realization is what creates the next oscillation in your desire for something else. And that's why the experience of arrival is a negative, is, is eventually at some point of an experience of negativity, an experience of absence. And this is why I get into excess and absence because the experience of a non-dynamical state is precisely the experience of absence. And yet that experience of the non-dynamical state came about because an excess of oscillations of contradiction, which were able to collapse and create and saturate that space of mastery or the PhD or whatever it was. So all that work that went into it collapses it into this beautiful unity which is nevertheless static and non-dynamical because of it. I hope I did, like, I, I touched on that, some of the That things. was beautiful. That was magnificent. That's exactly what I wanted, an arc through your thinking. It was absolutely magnificent. Um, what's very interesting is one of the reasons I like your thinking is because it's full to the brim with uh, my beloved irony. And what I mean by irony is that the very thing that human beings do to uh, achieve something then functions as the undermining of that very effort. So irony is where X does Y for Z and Y is why X doesn't get Z, for example. And so this, what's very important, I think, if we're going to describe, because what I hear in everything that you're saying is sort of kind of pointing out some sort of underlying fundamental principle that is an operation that we see in the human subject and their operations and how things unfold, obviously the end of the doctrine of being in and, and Hegel. And what it seems to be is whatever this fundamental principle is, however we language it, it has to have within itself a certain dynamism that occurs, that it falls back on itself and it becomes dynamic again, then it becomes stagnant. And in that stagnancy, it becomes, it reaches a threshold that begins the process over and over again. I think you described this very well um, in your essay in the Hegel anthology, as, as we were saying. Um, I really like irony because um, when you read literature, like Harold Bloom once said that great literature always entails irony. All the great stories seem to entail irony, which is this fundamental principle of we do something, which is why we don't get it. Like we're trying to reach a state where we're stagnant, like you're saying, like we get this inerrant, this kind of inertia. But when we achieve that inertia is precisely the moment we, when we find out there's a dynamicism in it and we lose it because it reaches a new threshold, right? Like you become the uh, CEO that you always wanted to be. You think you're going to be at that stable state. And it turns out that when you're the top CEO, you have to make a lot of decisions and you never actually feel stable because it's a whole new threshold that you passed of responsibilities. Or you become a celebrity or you become a famous writer and it turns out there's all these new things. Like precisely the moment when you thought you would finally get that inertia is when, bam, it explodes and there's new there's new dynamicism. That is an operation. Well, that's, that's what you see in a lot of great literature. And if there's something about literature to me that actually what is a good story is a kind of proof for how reality actually is, then we, we, we would want a philosophy that would actually kind of foundationally or fundamentally have a description that we would actually see kind of in operation, rather it be Faulkner or Chekhov or, 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 uh, or hey, obviously Shakespeare or Sophocles or different things. And all of these stories are constantly talking about human beings when they, uh, they're doing their best or they're doing what they think is what they need. They actually end up undermining their very efforts or 
or when they and and that's what I hear you describing. And I think it's also interesting. So that right there, I think, is of note. If we're trying to kind of suggest what fundamental philosophy or a description of fundamental reality is most likely to be actual, then we would expect it to be reflected in great literature or great art or great stories, right? And if it is, that would increase the probability that it has something to do with the actual world that we live in. So, you know, from my own uh, love of irony and, and, and literature, what you're describing come to mind. What's also very interesting is I know you you have that wonderful piece on avoid death, on the idea that we want to avoid death. And yet simultaneously, there's a death drive or a kind of stasis drive, right? Which doesn't seem like it would make any sense. But it actually makes sense if precisely there is something about the human being that needs to seek this state of immobility without letting themselves know that the, that what they want is a static, like a static state, right? There's a kind of self-deception that has to be an operation where we don't actually want to look clearly at where we're headed, because if we did, it would not function to almost attract us anymore because we would have to see it for what it is, right? So there's this interesting kind of way in which we want to return to a static state that is death while at the same time not looking at something like not actually facing death directly. There's like a developmental process that creates plausible deniability that is in operation. So we, do, we want to say, oh no, we, we're afraid of death. Um, which then results in us not seeing what death is for us to reflect on, well, well, wait a minute, maybe if I would have become that CEO, it is phenomenologically kind of similar to death, right? Because if you did that, it would kind of negate from you becoming the CEO or the static state is actually being what you wanted, and you would have to reflect on yourself and maybe change, right? So it's almost like something I think about is how it would seem as if our tendency to want to avoid death would make us then want to avoid a static state, but actually avoiding death leads to us heading toward a static state, which doesn't seem like it would make sense unless the problem is the facing of death makes too vivid where we're going. And, what, and then if we did that, we would have to go on and acknowledge, oh, that's not going to work. And we'd have to change right now. And then that, like, what would that even look like? Well, that almost seems to me, and I'd be curious what you think about that, well, that would start affecting status. That would almost lead to status anxiety because you'd have to change how you live, right? You'd have to stop seeking the CEO position that everyone thinks is a good um, operation. You'd have to stop seeking the position of being the great artist or the stable state, which would result in you then acting outside of what gains trust in the social order. Because you were saying how that kind of stagnancy creates trust. It's, it's like if you right now realized you had to change how you were living, because what you were heading toward was a kind of static state that actually is phenomenologically very similar to the death that you're trying to avoid, that would almost put a call on your life that you would have to change, that in that very changing would then make you harder to trust by everyone around you. And there would be a kind of status anxiety that would come from that. So it's almost like we engage in these plausible deniabilities so we don't have to begin right now acting in a way that would uh, impact how the people around us trust us or the status that we may have or our positioning in the social order. And so it's it's almost like we have to it's it to me, it, it suggests how the status anxiety, the um the 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 static drive, how the avoidance of death actually are all in operation of the individual trying to maintain their position in the collective with the people around them and continuing to be trustworthy. And then also if you break that trajectory, you have to ask yourself questions of, well, what am I going to do now? What am I going to choose now that I have to make decisions outside of kind of the social tract, which can also be anxiety producing? I'd be curious if you have any reflections or thoughts on what I just said. Yeah, um, a couple of things. Um, so, you know, taking the, the reverse angle for a second, just to illustrate a point is that uh, let's say you go ahead and get married. Okay, success. Well done. You're married now. But somehow, the very stasis of it makes you feel like you're not living. And so you have a midlife crisis and you decide to uh, shake up your life again and really live, man. Now, if you're totally familiar with death, meaning ultimate stasis, maybe the stasis of your marriage doesn't freak you out. Maybe... Uh, the stasis of whatever position you found yourself in doesn't quite freak you out that much in it, in it, at least it's 
the the quality of its stasis, the quality of its inertia. I'm not saying that you born a slave and you're quite happy to be a slave because it's static. No, some conditions are going to be shittier than others and you're going to want to get out of them. But all things being equal, there may be a position you find yourself in that is perfectly nice, but it's static and thereby you feel like, well, I need to live dynamically and so I'm going to leave this thing, right? But maybe uh, a familiarity with death allows you to simply exist in it. Now, I wonder, you know, like the world, uh, theoretically, according to most scientists, um, is heating up to uh, existential threat levels, right? And a lot of that is um, just our sheer neurotic uh, movement. Like we can't fucking stop. We can't stop. Now, the idea that we're supposed to always remain dynamic and so on, at least economically, is, 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 has been pretty seen through. And we see what the results are of uh, people who can't stop. We just can't stop. Got to gotta do it, right? And when we had that little moment of uh, realizing who the actual essential workers were, and that actually everyone else could stop <laughs> if they had to, there was a moment that a lot of the people who could stop realized, holy shit, I can stop. And they didn't even realize it, right? And some of them were even like, this, this isn't bad, actually. I mean, after a while, you get bored being just in the house. You would have liked to go out and have some fun. But the part about not working as much or working from home or whatever the case was um, appealed to a lot of people. Um, so all, all that to say that there is a hyperconsumption, extractive nature to the function which says, I am not okay with static. And, um, and so on one level, uh, accepting death may lead to an embracement of stasis that actually might look something like a much more healthy uh, society. Um, but on the flip side, uh, fundamentalism is also describable as a static mind frame. So you have, uh, again, the irony of not ever really quite solving this problem. Regardless, we seem to be drawn to a, a position of stasis, which, whether it is successive stasis or continual singular stasis, like I'm a farmer and I just down to be a farmer or no, I need to climb every rung of the ladder and get all the way to the center um, is, uh, you know, like you mentioned uh, de Tocqueville um, when he comes, to, he comes to America and he describes society and he's like, wow, everyone's really like the level of wealth is incredible. Even for like what would otherwise be peasants, these people are living incredibly. However, they all seem crazily unhappy way more unhappy that back home in Europe, they're all stressed out. They can't stop thinking about the next thing they have to buy and so on. And he notes status anxiety then and how much further increased it was in a capitalist society versus a feudalist society. So obviously that's not an argument for feudalism, but it is an argument that uh, a sense of constantly needing to improve one's status, meaning be, be highly socially dynamical, um, is uh, potentially breeds unhappiness. So anyway, just just to that's sort of a counter to everything you were saying. It's not that I disagree with what you're saying, but I wanted to present the the other view. No, I think it's extremely important because this is exactly um. What's very interesting is everything you were describing is in a way suggesting that there is in Grammy this language for the moment a kind of counterfeit. Now, by counterfeit, I mean. A something that looks like a reflection of something fundamental, but actually isn't, or it does not approximate it in the manner that is going to unleash dy dynamism. So, for example, you were talking about like the auto mastery, like when you're really good at something, you're kind of an auto master. But also, when you're a mindless individual carrying out something terrible in the banality of evil, that's automatic, right? So you could say there is a similar structure between the auto master and the automatic, and yet. 
I think it's fair to say the auto master and the automatic are yet a result of a different process. To be an auto master, you'd have to work a long time. You'd have to say train in music, but to be automatic, you simply perhaps have to follow orders. But there's always going to be different similarities, right? And the problem we've had in a net conversation before is the difficulty of saying, is one better or not, right? Like the kind of moral claim. But then it also seems kind of cowardly to never say that one is better than the other, right? So we have this problem of trying to figure out the basis for a claim of better versus worst that at the, at the same time we know is dangerous to engage with because you start doing ethics. But then if you don't do ethics, that seems kind of cowardly, right? So there's a tension there. So the question would be, what would you base a decision or a claim of better or worst on that would have some sort of participation in fundamental reality? Now, the reason why, yes, please. I was just going to say, I think that uh, this is where we can introduce limit. Yes, exactly. That's okay. exactly right. And to me, what's very interesting, what you're talking about, the death example. So it seems wrong to say that sta stasis is necessarily bad. That doesn't seem correct. But it also seems um, incorrect to say that it is necessarily good, right? So it seems like it has a lot to do with the particular expression of stasis. And you see, the problem is it's almost like when we talk about the stasis of being a CEO or a husband or a worker, it's almost like a counterfeit. And the reason why it's a counterfeit is because it's not actually the deepest stasis. In the sense of the deepest stasis seems to be death, right? Death is kind of a deepest stasis. But then the question would be, why? Why is death such a deep stasis? And you see, what seems to happen is when we avoid death, we get a society that then orbits kind of counterfeit stasis, if you will, that are actually more like an immorality. But if we make death center, and then it becomes kind of the stasis of the society to be comfortable with death, the reason why that actually may be fair to say it's better in an almost ethical sense is because death is limit. Like it is inherently limit. It is the limit of finitude itself. And so if everyone's st static state, their status, is based on an encounter with death, of which is a very intimate encounter with the limitation of finitude itself, that seems very different and sociologically distinct from it being the status of a husband or worker. And, and that's why, and, I'll, and I'll, I would cu be curious of comments before, because this is it would seem as if making death center in the society and making that the basis of a sta of a stasis would make the basis of a stasis a intimate hit with limitation. And the reason why limitation seems to be better to orbit a society around is because based on your work, limitation is dynamic. Whereas being a CEO is not necessarily dynamic in this fundamental way. What It's almost like when you become a CEO... The fact that it's dynamic, again, is a kind of trick. It's not fundamental. It's like, oh, it actually was all just kind of an imaginary symbolic order that I thought was going to be dynamic. But it's really not. Actually, I just have different jobs and different things. And there's a certain sort of um, dissatisfaction or deconstruction that occurs with that. But when you look at death, and that death is this kind of principle of which, no, that's the limit. That's it. But then seeds, things die and there's new life. And then you coming to terms with death actually then forces you to change how you view your life right now. Like, I guess that's almost, let me put it this way. When you say, I'm going to be a CEO, then the change of your life is ahead of you. You know, it's kind of virtual. It's not really there. But when you say, I'm going to die, that affects you now. That's kind of a realization right now that then has a dynamic unfolding in the present moment and your stat the thing that you're finding a stasis in entails the seeds of an op of a dynamic in it i'd be curious how you respond to that because then i think it exactly goes to this question of limitation as fundamental yeah i think that um death as final ultimate limit i love the notion of counterfeit uh states of uh stasis um and i think that I think that in the absence of a confrontation or, or communion with death, uh, you can call all of the uh, states of stasis counterfeit. Um, the reason being that they're phenomenologically discovered to be counterfeit um, and, and thereby always elicit dissatisfaction 
um, because you discover them to be counterfeit or empty or petite object ah uh, or whatever you want to whatever you want to call it the the thing you discover is discovered to be now here like Lacan would call it a partial object like it's not complete but actually that's precisely wrong in my opinion it is precisely that it is a complete object that you discover it in its static form as absence. It's precisely that the object has been saturated and that you arrive at it phenomen phenomenologically having saturated it, that it gives you the effect of absence. Otherwise, absence simply doesn't exist anywhere. The only absences there are, the only true nothings there are, the negativities, are literally the flip side of saturated excess mm. within a limit. Um, so, and that's why, you know, limit for me is first principle. Like we were talking earlier before recording, it's like limit can be f seen as, and I view it as, and I, and I, and I, you know, the only, the only argument that, that limit is not first principle is that nothing is first principle, nothingness. Um, and obviously limit seems to entail difference, but once you understand that limit, limit's precise effect upon its own interiority is to create absence as opposed to difference. That the saturation of a given limit produces interiority, which is self-absent by nature of its very saturated state. The state of that saturation, as I was talking about earlier, the sense of reaching a quantitative threshold of knowledge acquisition for, let's say, riding a bicycle, right? 12 times, 13 times, 14 times, I'm thinking about it. And then all of a sudden it's second nature. It's that process of problematizing the bicycle has become absent vis-a-vis -vis an excess of, exp of learning. You reach a threshold. The mantra is the same thing. Milkshake, milkshake, milk. It just means milkshake. I guess I got to do it a few more times. Milkshake, milkshake, milkshake. There's some quantitative threshold beyond which semantic satiation takes place and milkshake no longer means milkshake it means some indeterminate key of the universe and that's the beauty of mantras that there's a quantitative threshold beyond which a phenomenological absence takes place where the thing no longer means what it means because you saturated it so um the arguments that say that well negativity is itself first principle um, I think, in my view, number one, how do you get from pure negativity to anything? You tell me. And number two, without limit, the only way to get from pure negativity to anything is limit. And by that, I mean, even if you wanted to say you could quantize negativity and create an accumulative effect of negativity that eventually turns into a positivity, like so much negative negativity that it becomes a positivity. Well, in order for that to happen, you're talking about a saturation. You're talking about a limit which creates a saturation point, a threshold point beyond which something becomes positive. There's a threshold we're talking about. That threshold is limit. So um, anyhow, yeah. Excellent. Um, you said a lot of wonderful things. And actually on the partial object, it's, um, I was just speaking with Thomas Jock and we were talking about Aristotle's metaphysics and the difference between a primary and a, a secondary substance. And a secondary substance would be like man, like Daniel is a man. But the primary substance would actually be Daniel. Well, the weird thing is I can give a definition for man. I can tell you what a man is. But if I were to give you a definition for Daniel, you actually could not do it. It's the movement from definition to definitive. Daniel becomes definitive. But what that means in a very weird way is that the secondary substance is actually in a way full, the full definition, whereas the definitive in its substance becomes partial and is complete in that partiality. 
because you can never get to the fullness of Daniel without being Daniel, not because of an essential absence, but because it exceeds the scope of your limitation of experience. But where, but where is even the partiality? Because I see, because I see Daniel as definitive being absolutely complete vis-a-vis -vis definitive. Now, it's precisely that it's definitive that it eludes definition, right? Yes. Because Daniel is the definition. The partiality is a testament. Like, it's partial in the sense that you cannot give it a full definition, but that is precisely a testament you to its gave completion. It a full the full definition is the absence. Daniel is the full definition. Yes, that's correct. So the, you, have, you have the full definition. The, the issue is, is that the partiality is actually an invitation into the fullness of the experience, that it is not a missing partiality, but that is an ever deepening because you are always limited from getting the fullness. But that means you're not limited from participating in the fullness, like I the know, kind I'm of just, apophatic. I guess I'm just trying to say that the apophatic, for instance, is only apophatic and missing because it's apophatic, which means it's imminent, like apophatic comes from the... Yes. Total imminence of something, yes. God, let's say, saturating absolutely everything. So that it's a full completeness, which yields the absence. So I'm only pushing back on the on the language of partial. The language even of lack should be totally tied to, in my opinion, <laughs> you know, I keep saying this, totally tied to the absence that arises from a saturated excess because if lack is described as a partial object or as lack as such um then we somehow think of incompleteness as absence whereas absence is actually completeness there is only a perception of lack due to the uh, the 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 saturation of a space or time in my view, of course, this is all just in my view, but if limit is going to be first principle, then the only nothings are, as Hegel would say, the nothingnesses of everything, where you have a totality which produces a self-sameness interior to the, to the limit, which itself presents itself as absence. And, um, and so when we arrive at a person and they seem to have a lack, uh, again, we're just experiencing the absence uh, uh, produced by uh, the effect of, of, of the excess either projected onto them or the excess uh, of them within themselves, um, you know, which is, which is also very possible. Uh, no. For instance, fall in love with a, with a fundamentalist. Let's say, you know, all they do is, uh, let's say they're, Let's say they're just Daniel, right? You fall in love with just Daniel, the definitive Daniel, right? You get to him, you're, 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 you, you either, it, there's two choices. He's either nothing or everything. He's either nothingness because you experience him as absence because you can't define him and there's no differential in between them. You can't be like, I like this about him and that about him. It's just, he's just Daniel. Or you fall completely in awe, which is another kind of indeterminacy, which overwhelms the, the, the schema of your mind and you can't classify him and thereby you're in love with him, right? So anyway, just to experience like both, and, and that's an interesting just side note that being in love and finding someone totally self-absent is, they're almost the same quality of indeterminacy where you can't... Um, you can't put them in in uh, determinate baskets. You know what I mean? No, I, absolutely. I don't disagree with any of that because the partiality is on the side of understanding, whereas oh. it is not there on reason. Because what is partial in space is fullness and time. And you see, yeah. that's like I try to argue, like you Epi take... epistemic partiality. Yes, that's correct. That's exactly right. And so the issue is that what we get if. If time is fundamental, then actually what is partial is only epistemically. It is tentatively partial as a result of limitation, which is also the very grounds necessary for the experience of the fullness of time. And so that's, that's what we're, I think, getting at, which I like about your theory, is it unveils that all of these terms, you have to go into them and they unpack them and they kind of blow up, right? And that, like, so the reason why I think limit, as we were saying, is, is so... So so anyway, um, first, if death is center, 
then that necessarily, why I think that's really important is because it suggests there is a necessary limit to human beings. And there's this giant question on the possibility of a presuppositionless philosophy, like Holgate talks about with Hegel. Is Hegel's philosophy presuppositional? And I think it is correct to suggest that Hegel's philosophy is really centered on the question of limit, finitude, et cetera, so forth. And the question is the following. Is a limit presupposition less? Or is a limit a presupposition? If limit is a presupposition less, then it is the proper ground of philosophy. And ergo, the proper ground of thinking about any of these things, and all language has to be seen in light of that new schema, right? It would seem as if from a kind of a political, economic, sociological structure, orbiting death increases the probability that a given person defines limitation and status in terms of that kind of ultimate limitation, not a counterfeit, right? Which then increases the probability the average person may ground their thinking on something that is presupposition less versus presupposition no. So the first question, because then this will get us the limit, I don't think death is presupposition. I don't think there's a pre. <laughs> do, do we think death is a presupposition? Uh, no. I mean, I, you know, that's, it's, uh, some people do, right. uh, you know, the life extension crowd certainly, you know, would like to make death optional. Um, <laughs> but I think ultimately, ultimately, um, at the very least on a biological level, uh, no, of course. Yeah. yeah there's no, there was no, so then even if you're the life, this is what's interesting. I'm glad you brought that up because even if you're in the life extension crowd, you are at the very least limited from not having to confront death like you have to confront the problem of death even if because it's a factual presuppositionless reality so you are limited in your actions if you will based on the presuppositionless facticity of death so there's a limit there does that make sense of what we're saying so far yeah i mean uh even if you want to negate death um the very notion of negating death acknowledges the presuppositionlessness of death as sort of the ultimate. Um, I mean, I think it's that death <laughs> obviously has this this ultimate uh, character feature in uh, in society and and in the phenomenological experience of living. Uh, precisely that uh, it's the opposite of living, and that uh, you wouldn't be having a phenomenological experience without the um suspension of the death state in your favor you know and so and then of course you understand that life uh exists by regeneration and processes which pass through death and then um you realize that the entire circle of life and the reason anything here uh, supports you is through a cycle which constantly passes through the limit of death um so in that sense in just a rational sense it's um it's presuppositionless, and um, and I think even if we were able to sort of suspend death or quote conquer it in some way, everything that would be sustaining life, even the immortal life, would nevertheless be wholly contingent on passing through the cycles uh, which entail the limit of death. So that the limit of death would be your lifeblood anyway, even if you were immortal. Exactly, and to me, if so then if that's presuppositionless, anything that arises in response to that could be an extension of that presuppositionless and in of itself, therefore, be pre presuppositionless. Maybe not. It depends on the details. But if that is a presuppositionless basis, then something done in response I to mean, that in of itself could be an extension of the presuppositionless. I totally agree. And that's why I think that, you know, and I, I, I think that other people like... For instance, Bard, uh, it was nice to see him actually acknowledge, for a guy who like really hates the notion of pretending uh, that we're immortal, uh, was able to acknowledge, um, as I do, uh, and I think what you're pointing at, which is that even if a, uh, a proxy or a, a semblance of stasis uh, were achieved that was totally fallacious, um, if it were achieved in direct recognition of 
uh, its desire to remain immortal or its desire to combat death or be in relation to death or whatever the case is, then it would be thereby presuppositionless and, um, and far more stable. Um, and perhaps that's why uh, religions, I always think about like, why the fuck are religions so enduring? And I think usually in my, like what I come to is that it has something to do with the way it's able to tarry with and relate to death. Um, and I, of course, you know, a lot of the major religions have that. Some of them have them have it less. Um, but, you know, like Judaism has it a bit less. Um, but in the, in, the, in the case of Christianity or Buddhism, um, the idea, for instance, just take Christianity or Buddhism, of an eternal life. In Buddhism, it's recurrent. In, in Christianity, it's sort of linear. Um, at, the ver at least it deals head on with the question of death, right? So if we were to, for instance, and I was thinking about how to cure neur neuroses, um, or, or suspend it or ease it or mitigate it. And, um, and it occurs to me that you don't have to be a fundamentalist about curing neuroses. The, 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 it can either be, and I've actually experienced, experienced this in my own life, you can either totally accept that you're going to die and become dirt and be mulched, or you can totally accept that you're immortal. Either one works. Either one works because you're dealing directly with the question and problem of death. Either one is presuppositionless. Either one is uh, rational and sort of works to ease neuroses. Um, so in that sense, I think you're absolutely right. And what's kind of fun about that is it allows us to be a little creative with our approach to death. And with our approach to mitigating neuroses and um, and creating uh, containers uh, that you know, it's like the Oscar Wilde. You know, it, it, what is fucking truth? What is the reality of the reality of the reality? What's the real religion? What's the real position? Well, of course, the answer is none of them. All of them uh, have fun with it. Do you know what I mean? Uh, like, I don't know who said it, but like, believe what a, in whatever religion is most fun to you. Um, as long as they confront death in a real way. And well, I mean, just as a thought, I mean, that would suggest I think religions generally have the potential, but if they don't face status anxiety and they get into a static drive, then they lose that. Like, like religions can actually sort of get, no, I'm saved. I don't have to worry about death. No, I'm not going to like, then what you're doing is you have a certain st stasis of your relation to death that does it means you actually stop tearing with death. So I think there's something about the religions that then lose facing anxiety that then loses the potential for dealing with this perhaps presuppositionless ground, right? And so I think that gets into the details of the particular religious kind of community. What was that Mr. Yeah, but yeah no, I think you're right. I, I mean that 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 I think maybe that's what I was trying to say is that um and it tails with my own experience. When I before I really dealt with death uh, in my late teens, early twenties, um, I believed I was immortal, right? So I thought, and I was raised vaguely Christian, so I, I thought I was immortal, and I thought death was bullshit, and I figured, uh, and, and theoretically that should work, right? Because I'm like, well, there's death, and I'm immortal, but I always had this dread that I was lying to myself. Um, I was kind of felt like I was telling myself a fairy tale. And then I go through a process after getting sober at age 22, uh, where I confront death and I'm like, no, I'm going to die. That's it. I don't have any more magical realism. I, I die and that's it. And I'm dirt. And it took me a while to, to finally deal with that. When I did, um, it was really liberating. And I suddenly realized, oh, the reason I was, reason I, I, I my whole life changed. And then later, I was like, now the spirit lives on. But I was able to return to the sense of an immortal spirit. Only a, and, and, this, and now it feels like, okay, legit, because I had faced the fear mm -hmm. and had been able to move through it, it's like, okay, I've actually faced that guy. I know that guy. 
I know that whole sphere of thought. I've been immersed in it. I've really soaked in it. I'm no longer afraid of my own thoughts of death. And, uh, and so the position I have now does not feel like a bypass. It's the very bypassed notion of not dealing with the negativity of death and just cutting straight to the solution, which produces um, the difficulties. Perhaps in Christianity, it works because you're constantly being confronted with uh, fucking a guy with nails through his hands and, uh, and so on. And uh, there's a lot of imagery of death and so on. And there's a lot of sort of darkness. Maybe uh, that helps. I don't know. Um, yeah. No, it's outstanding. I think basically what you're saying suggests to that wonderful line you have that the meaning of life is courage. Basically, the only way that death has the proper function presupposition less Lee is when it is faced with courage. There's a certain mode that the death has to be taken on to have this presuppositionless sort of potential to it. Otherwise, you're talking about death, but you're not actually facing death. Right. Because you can talk about something, but not actually have it in your bones. And I think basically on the topic of Christianity, it's become a disaster ever since the notion of faith was separated from faithful. Faith became belief out of body versus faithful to go into the trenches with people. And really to be like Christ, you have to be seen. You know, it's it it's very interesting in your thinking. Because the emphasis of status, like it all goes together, right? Like status anxiety, if you don't face that, then you become immobile and you're not facing death. If you go into a certain stasis, that in itself can be a counterfeit of death. So there's all these kind of checks and balances that kind of keep you orbiting this thing that is death, of which then death is the, is the presuppositionless ground of an extension of thinking based on limit. And I'll get to that. And basically, to me, Christianity has been screwed ever since... It has not been the basis of the status anxiety of being seen talking to people that everyone in your church thinks is a bad person and therefore your status is destroyed. Because there's also this question of how do you face your status anxiety if you plan it? Like if you plan it, won't it just kind of fall into your symbolic or imaginary registers and not actually be in service of facing your status? Well, one of the ways you do it is to talk to someone or interact with people that everyone around you thinks you shouldn't be interacting with and they may and you can't know for sure if they're going to question your status for doing it but the very fact they can means that you are facing your status anxiety not in a way that you plan but that is unpredictable that is actually by sitting with the tax collector or sitting with the prostitute that could put that could ruin your status within the community and when that is lost and instead then you're not actually facing death because you're not facing the death of your potential status or you're standing in the church. And it would seem like basically all religions, dare I say, all ideologies require this function of facing status that seems to have a lot to do with interacting with people that everyone in your tribe thinks you shouldn't interact with. Because that really will hurt your status in a non-planned or non-controllable way that you then, there's a lot of courage that I think comes into that. And one of the things I like that that I think has been lost in modern Christianity is that idea of Jesus is sitting with people that is going to destroy his status in a Jewish community. And that seems to be really critical for then having a new dynasty because you're freed. You know, you're freed from the stasis of the social order, but you're freed in a manner precisely that could get you killed. And that seems to be critical for really facing something like status anxiety. It has to have this possibility of a confrontation of death. And then if you have a social order that's orbiting death, that makes you more attuned to that or more kind of aware of that reality. And this, to me, what's very interesting is because I think this gets on the limit. So we're looking at death and death seems to be presuppositionless. And there's this question of how to relate to death in a manner that kind of keeps you more presuppositionless than not, if you will. And I definitely think that one of the reasons religion has this staying power, because it's almost like the power of the presuppositionless of death kind of in a way floats through the religion and helps give it a kind of strength even when it slips into assumptions of metaphysics or whatever. Just having that kind of relation of death helps it become more non-contingent, more able to sustain itself through history because it is dealing with a presuppositionless reality. Now, I'm not saying every religion and all of its beliefs are obviously presuppositionless, but by just dealing with this constant facticity, that gives it a certain lifeblood, even if it shouldn't have it, right? But, but then this, so if the point is, 
that what is based on a confrontation of death can then create a thought in extension from death that has a presuppositionless character. What would, to me, the closest you can get to death that is a distinct topic from death, but it still really shares in the presupposition lessness of death is limitation. Because death seems to be a limit. Like, this is a limit. This will occur. You cannot avoid this. And in that very, so then it would seem like limitation is presuppositionless because you know that at the very least you have to fight death. You have no choice but to fight death. If you want to live forever, you have to fight it. So now limit is presuppositionless. The and, reason and I, would, I would even say that it's more presuppositionless than death because we could say, well, we don't know if we live forever. Sure, right? sure, sure. We really don't, but we do know that we pass through some threshold. And um, uh, that, that is uh, absolutely uh, absolute. And I wanted to say regarding, uh, just before, and, and then you can continue, I wanted to just say re with regard to status anxiety, I, I sometimes just take it for granted. But of course, uh, death is the ultimate limit of, uh, of status, uh, social status on the bottom end of things. Yep. Um, whereas, let's say, a sense of indeterminate indeterminate uh indeterminate sorry <laughs> immortality uh or a sense of the that that pure interiority the interior of the interior of the interior that total centrality is sort of the um the desire as opposed to seeing status as a linear uh, ascension of rungs it's more um an uh, an ingress of rings uh, where the desire is to become further on the center. And in fact, once you're on the center of something, you can create an additional interiority within that center. Be like, you know what? Just me and you are the real cool ones. They're cool. They're still in the group. But now we have created a VIP section. And then the VIP section gets a VIP section and so on. You just keep wanting to uh, ingress into the interiority centrally. Um, but anyway, on the other side, outside the club, outside the VIP section, Beyond the city, you have the tundra. And if you get exiled to the tundra by yourself, you could die. And that is baked into our DNA, but it's also just a basic uh, a rule of thermodynamics. If you leave the boundary zone, you dissipate. Uh, or, or, or rather to say, bring this, when I say you leave, you'd be like, no, I'm still outside the boundary zone. But think of now yourself as a boundary zone. If you are interior, leaves your boundary zone, you dissipate and cease to be. So the idea is to always, you, yes, you're inside your interior, but that's only one interior removed from dissipation. Get yourself inside another interior. Now you're in another one, okay, but now you're only two levels removed from dissipation. Get yourself further into the center and further and further and so on. Um, so that is the sort of relation of status anxiety to death. Beautiful. And I think everything you described to put a, a, to a point, note in all of what you described, the limitation creates dynamicism. There's a limit, there's a line, and then there's all these dynamics that are at play, right? There's a kind of dynamicism that seems unavoidable from limitation. Maybe, and this is where, because a lot of what you were saying on this question of lack as excess or a kind of essential negativity gets into the giant debate between um, uh, dialectical materialism and new materialism, kind of to lose. Is there an essential lack in different things? And I think what I hear you saying, which is that the only lack has to be as, as a result of a fullness that it, that in its fullness, you are limited from experiencing, not because it is not there, but because it, it is full in time, just not spatial. And so you have to continue to relate to it as a true infinity. And that's actually the effect of a certain lack. But that lack is not essential. It is accidental to the fullness that has to be temporarily unfolded. And I think this is a really, again, the reason why I like your work as well is because making and i'll and i'll go back to this making limit most fundamental seems to be the way to bring dialectical materialism and new materialism together and that is the big problem i think we have right now where it's like okay it seems like deleuze has a lot of points here but then there's also parts of deleuze that seem to be leaving out this certain negativity in the subject well there does definitely seem to be a negativity in the subject but are we sure this negativity is due to an essential lack or maybe it's a result of an excess that the negativity is a result of not being able to get a grasp on the excess because it has an improper relation to the excess that it experiences as a negativity because it is not rightly attuned 
Um, and that to me is the like a lot of the question, right? Is there an essential negativity that is a product of negativity, an essential lack that then the negativity is a reflection of, or is the negativity a result of there being an excess that it's like, dang it, it's an excess to me. I feel limited from it. I feel negative because I'm limited from it. Well, wait a minute. What if you play with the limit? Like if you're limited from it, but it's there, then if you change your relation to the limit, it can be the birthplace of the dimacism of the life as opposed to keeping you from it. Because that's what I think is so interesting is when you're describing limit, limit creates all these dynamics, right? Like it's not a wall. It's not a limit is not an end. And this is why I really think it's important. The move you made where you say, wait a minute, I would say limit is more fundamental to death. Exactly. So death, Death is the facticity that is presuppositionless that in your relation to it necessitates a limit. That because it is in relation to the presuppositionless death, there would be reason to think the limit is presuppositionless in its most fundamental form. That the limit is more fundamental and it is also presuppositionless and therefore becomes a solid basis for thinking or choice, or philosophy in general. I just said a lot right there. Let me take a pause. Does that make sense of what I was saying? Yeah, totally. I, you know, the this issue with lack versus a, a, a pure positivity with regard to desire, like in a Deleuzean sense, um, is so easily resolved once you introduce limit. And it's not that lack doesn't occur, but that lack is the, is the response to a full state of absence. Um, so it's also the case that once, let's say, and limits, by the way, are revealed phenomenologically. They're not there, right? right? I mean, in some cases, they're there. You have the master, he's like, don't cross this line. You're like, okay, obviously, I have to cross the line then. You know, don't break this rule. All right, well, then I got to break the rule. Um, I'm here as your master. You only win the black belt after you beat me and so on. But I would say even in that case, you don't know where your threshold for being able to beat the master is going to be. You don't know if it's going to take five days, if it's going to take 25 years. You don't know how, you don't know where your limit is at. And by the way, here we're talking about limit in the exact reversed fashion as most people think of limit. We don't know where your limit, meaning your threshold into the new qualitative state of master beater is. That's the limit, threshold, beyond which you become the new thing. The limit, let's say, if you want to think of it negatively, the limits of your limitations, of your formal lim uh, former limitations, the limits of your... Uh, 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 learning which produced the mastery. So anyway, um, I think that bringing together that sort of Deleuzean, Hegelian contradiction that seems to be a contradiction that isn't really a contradiction uh, is important because it's the source of so much um, confusion, but also uh, uh, pretending to discard Hegel and the dialectic as, you know, non-rhizomatic um, and non-sort of potentiated, but meanwhile limit and the, the, the indeterminacy of a saturated limit, which Hegel calls sublation, but the indeterminacy of a saturated limit is pure potential. And so you have pure rhizomatic potential coming out of every single sublation. And Deleuzeans don't understand uh, how that could possibly be because they haven't thought through limit. So it's very, it's very, very simple. And, 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 the, and it's not that lack is wrong, it's just not first principle. Uh, lack arrives vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, um, the, those instances of pure potential indeterminacy, which are caused by a saturation of limit. So you have everything wrapped up into a single notion uh, or, or a single framework which uh, accounts for everything. And all you have to do is start with limit. And, um, and so, yeah, I like that you're, that you're, I love this conversation because it's, it's a, I think some of the, the notions are so baked in uh, that it's difficult for people to somehow, somehow or sometimes really grasp. Um, but 
yeah, it's like, you know, if you've, if you're a delusion and you're totally against the idea of desire uh, being any, having anything to do with lack, you're not going to understand anything to do with uh, Lacan or Hegel. Um, and you're going to think that that's wrong and, and, and so on. But if you understand it all through the lens of limit and what limit entails with regard to excess, absence, etc., cetera, um, then it all starts to sort of just come together and you realize it's all kind of the same thing. Mm. Yeah. No, I think that's very well put. Well, so for me, you know, I was I was speaking to you before. I feel like, you know, the other side that is argued with the speculative realist, like a Quentin M. when after finitude is that contingency is most fundamental. And what he's trying to argue is like, okay, Kant, you know, we can never access the noumenon, but we can know that we you know, that this pen is phenomenal and it might have something to do with the noumenal, but we can't know. Well, that might then, we can know that, that it might have something to do with it. So what Quentin tries to argue is that the possibility becomes absolute. And then if you simply say, well, everything actually is only possible, that there's no necessity, no natural laws, no nothing, then that potentiality means everything is contingent. And we can know contingency, therefore we can know the real world. But in that, you have to get rid of all necessity. There's no natural law, stars could turn into butterflies, anything is possible. But by saying anything is possible, since we can know possibility, and there is no reality other than possibility, then you know as much as you can, therefore you overcome, I think it's called the correlationism of Kant. That's what Quentin tries to do. The reason why I have sympathies toward making contingency most fundamental is because I think that argument sounds good, but the problem is if contingency, contingency is contingent upon not being not contingent. Like if contingency realizes a non-contingent status, like a stable state, well, then it can't flip back into contingency because now it has become non-contingent, right? And so there's a lit, there's a what? A limit to what contingency can realize and still be most fundamental and have this operation of dealing with the problem of correlationism that Kant is doing. But you see the funny thing to be, to say something very general that I'm happy to unpack. The other problem is that Quentin's explanation of the universe simply does not match experience. I do not experience the, the chair turning into butterflies. I experience the world as if there is necessity. Now, maybe necessity is not deepest, but my experience suggests that Quentin is being very speculative. So in that way, it's unsatisfying, even if it is coherent as a model. But if I say limit is most fundamental, and in that, if limit is limited from being a limit, it becomes what? Unlimited. Well, something that's unlimited can impose upon itself a new limit and then take it away and back and forth and back and forth. So you have a certain dynamicism that emerges if limitation falls back on itself. It limits itself from being limited, then becomes unlimited and create can create new limits. So you can get this dynamicism, just like the true infinity that's going on in Hegel. So it becomes completely coherent. And it also makes sense that limit is the kind of foundational premise, premise principle, because I experience chairs as limited to be chairs. I experience me as limited to be Daniel, right? But here's the key. As I am limited to be Daniel, I am not limited to just be Daniel, to merely be Daniel as this space. So this is the key to limit. Like if I have, this is what's so weird. I have a kind of control over limit. So the limit becomes a kind of expression to the degree I can be courageous or I can face my fears or deal with my status. All of those, my status becomes a limitation but then I choose my relation to that limit or if I choose to up, upend it or to deconstruct it. So the limit has a creative principle in it. It becomes almost the placeholder of a creative act. It's kind of like holding the creative act that's going on. Please, Mr. Ebert. I was going to say one, one easy way to illustrate this is going back to your idea of uh, uh, the definitive Daniel, right? So... If, you're, if you are the definitive Daniel, which is the ultimate limit on description, right? What happens is you become limitless. Daniel could be anything. Yep, exactly. Because you've limited the description so deeply, it suddenly becomes limitless. So this is the relationship and the, the very functional relationship between limit and limitlessness that the more you limit something, the more it is internally unlimited in terms of its uh, potentiality. 
And that's, that's really the beauty of limit is that it produces both the unlimited and the unlimited produces limit. Um, and um, it's a very neat, it's a very neat way to think about everything, uh, neat in all senses of the word. Well, and I think it shows that finitude creates infinity, like Hegel said, like limit is finitude in the beginning was the limit you want to say, and the limit is a creating principle of an unfolding, it's an unfolding form, if you will, it's a formulation, like a form has a limitation in its structure like a trajectory, but it is a moving trajectory that is an unfolding, as Hegel likes to say, of that thing that is limited, that becomes unlimited at its maximum limitation. And the reason why I think this is important is because it has social, and I know you have to go. I've really enjoyed this. I don't know where the time goes. It's re it's really dinner another, treat. Another ten minutes. Okay, if, great. Okay. Sounds good, sir. Is that if you make contingency critical, like central, like in a speculative realism, then what is the most fitting thing to do is to create options, to create possibilities, to leave your options open, because that would align you with most fundamental reality. But if most fundamental reality is actually limitation and that limitation is creative, then what you need to do in your everyday life is choose a limitation. <laughs> choose something you marry yourself to. Choose something that you can become an auto mastery. You, you commit. It's what I call the absolute choice. If limit is creative, then you need to absolutely choose a limit so that your life is creative. Versus if contingency is, ba is the basis of everything, then you choose on leaving things out. You don't commit to anything. Because it all, you actually maintain an openness that ironically in that very openness is not dynamic at all because it does it. That's the weird thing. And that's why I think the stakes between is contingency most fundamental or is limit most fundamental is huge. Now, I think a lot of people on the, because the giant lose debate, and I think you're correct that once you focus on limit, things become much clearer. I think the idea is, oh, wait, but if we, you know, Deleuze would be on the side of contingency, right? Wouldn't he be like possibility, rhizomatic and different things? And the problem is once you get to the most fundamental level, everything is very nuanced, like little differences make a huge, huge thing. I think, I think basically there does seem to be a difference between creativity and contingency where a Deleuze with that new materialism, this kind of rhizomatic creativity creativity is not so much a contingency like an open end because to create something you have to commit to it like you can't create anything without that committed because you can't get to the auto mastery i think there is room to think about the metaphysics of deleuze as more on the side of creativity than on the side of contingency like the speculative realist now i would need more time to expand that but we'll just take that creativity oh, yeah. do you think that's fair to say mr uh, ebert yeah okay and this is the key if deleuze is creative then there is a limitation there that could possibly bring him together with Hegel. The question is how, right? And I think you've been pointing that out. To me, I think the issue is that the question of where does the lack appear? Where does it show up? Um, for Deleuze, what they wanted to say is on the floor, they were like, look at children. When you look at children, all they do is go around looking for connections. They don't have some, you don't see a kind of fundamental lack in children, right? They seem to actually be very creative. They're flowing. They're kind of lost in themselves, right? So Deleuze is like, how do you explain that? I think what I've been thinking about is how the lack that gets essentialized emerges in the encounter of the other, the das Ding, like the encounter of the other that exceeds your scope. And then they can, they challenge your status. They challenge you like like the child is playful. They're not thinking about anything. And then one day dad is disappointed. Oh, and now, now the lack enters. But this is the key. The lack seems to come from the relation that has something to do with a certain status that then, this is the question. The negativity then is more kind of an excess though because the father is outside the scope, right? Like the other okay. is outside the scope. And this is where you can see the formulation because, yeah, we feel our relations. Relations are very tangible. They're very real. Please, please. I almost think of the, 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 the relationality and relata and the sense of connectivity as being like a, 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 a set of um, collectible fucking baseball cards or something. And you have all the baseball cards you think you need, uh, and you have them sorted away in your schema in your brain. And um, you see an orange, and you don't really lack an orange because you have the orange in your head. Is you could like 
want to have an orange or desire an orange without the lack, right? So very Deleuzian, whatever. But then suddenly you see something that you have no uh, understanding of. You don't have the card. You're like, I didn't know that baseball card existed. Which card is that? I'm clearly missing it. Now, that sense that the card exceeds your schema, right? There's a, there's a sense in which it is, yeah. Yeah. it is too large or too different or somehow exists outside of in which you experience a, a, an inadequacy which has been exceeded by this experience. And so now you have to either assimilate it or accommodate it in some way, create a new schema for it, and uh, after that, uh, then you don't lack it anymore, let's say, right? And you can go on experiencing desires. Deleuze would like to say where you're just desiring shit uh, positively, creatively. But the thing is that we're always experiencing lack. Why is that then? Well, it's because, you know, we're experiencing constantly combinations of things. Let's say we have a schema of strawberry uh, 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 cream and uh, and sugar, but we never had them all together, right? We had strawberries. I'm, I'm good with that. We had cream. I'm good with that. We had sugar. I'm good with that. But someone then presents strawberry cream sugar. And I'm like, oh shit, I don't have that schema. I have all the individual ones, but relationally, I haven't, I don't know that one. I'm missing out. I have this FOMO or whatever the case, or I've been to a bunch of parties, but I never went to that party. You guys are having a special party. We've done a bunch of podcasts, but we've never done this podcast, right? So all of a sudden, there is a relational uh, 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 schema which presents itself as fundamentally new to our schema, and a lack is produced that is a genuine lack. Like, like you, FOMO is real. It happens all the time. We can't say that that is, uh, arises from some kind of like uh, as... Deleuze would call it like a, an interest. Um, it's much more fundamental than that. And, uh, and it occurs because it's about different combinations, very rhizomatic, but it produces a lack, which then produces a, a, a movement toward it uh, to satiate that lack. So lack is constantly occurring, I think, and uh, I'm sort of thinking in real time right here as I talk, but I think it's about these relational sort of rhizomatic dynamics. We could have all the schemas present, but not in particular combination. And combination, relational combination is the very premise of uh, potential Beautiful. and possibility. That's exactly right. Beautiful. Um, I mean, what I would say is if relate, you know, there's all this talk now, and I know we're out of time, but this has been a complete trade, is that relations are real, right? That they're like real, like you were saying, FOMO is very real. The key is that the lack seems to, the reality of the lack is in the reality of the relation. And that it, and that that is where we need to locate it. And for me, the way, what I've been thinking about is it seems like you start in Deleuze, then you have the encounter of the other. The lack becomes real in the relation. And then the question is getting back to Deleuze, which means you have to go do the work of Lacan, per se. You have to do the work of faith. Because that's, it seems like a lot of delusions, not all, I'm just speaking generally, they don't face the... You know how earlier we were saying facing death versus not facing death? It's like to, like you, you got to get back to that creativity, you have to face the death. You can't say just become animal and not face the reality of lack that is in the relation. You have to face that. And that's where I think Lacan and the psychoanalysis are like, you can't run from that. You have to face that. But it, in facing that, you can do the work of um, becoming creative and connecting and delusion again. Like it is not a fatalism. Yeah. But then it's almost like the difference between, I've been thinking about this, Cheap delusionism and costly delusion, to use a Bonhoeffer phrase, like you can't have a, well, we're all creative and desire and play and it's kind of just, you don't have to do any work, but there is a very real costly delusionism that faces the death, faces the real lack in the relation, but doesn't become fatalistic over it and actually is, is working with that very limitation as creative potential. Like you, you use that as the limit that is creative. 
Like that itself becomes the dynamic source where the lack that is in the relation, you're limited from not having relation. You're limited from not having relations being real. You're limited from not having that lack be real. But that very limitation is then what you work with to make the lack, you know, I guess, drive. You work with, you identify and it, and it moves into a dynamic state. So I think I've really appreciate, I know we have to go now. I've really appreciated Alex. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, Daniel. This was great. Very generative. And I'll definitely be trans uh, uh transcoding this into my brain. <laughs> uh thank you so much thank you alex i've appreciated it. thank you sir all the best to you thank you for your time i've enjoyed it all the best and thank you for your work it really is a gift thank Likewise. you alex appreciate thank it sir